Library, if you don't, grab a pew Bible, and I want you to take down the book of 1 Corinthians and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me join with John and all the shepherds here and express my appreciation uh, and my excitement for being a part of uh, this new collaborative effort. Uh, Indeed, John and I go back a long ways. In fact, I, I'm back to having another Haley as a shepherd uh, in my life. Uh, his dad, John, is here, John and Becky, uh, dear, dear friends of, uh, of mine. Uh, they have been great mentors in my life and for Cheryl and I together, and uh, what a blessing it is uh, to see and be able to work with them and now to be able to work with John and Steph and all of you uh, here at this family of Christ at Valerie. As well as Shane. Uh, Shane and I also go back many, many years, and so this is truly a joy. All right. Fun question. Who here has seen snow? Oh, all right. Hey, that's good for a Florida crowd. All right. Who here, who here has seen so much snow that you could play in it and make snowballs and build a snow fort? Yes. All right. All right. Hey, good crowd. This is working. Who here has run across a frozen lake? All right. There's a few of us that are really stupid. Yes. Yes. Hey, I've done that myself. Oh, what an experience it was. I grew up in West Texas, all right? So in West Texas, it would be super cold generally during the winter months. It was always very windy and cold was definitely a part of it. But when it snowed and really snowed really good, that was a treat. And that happened one year when I was about 12 years old. And man, you had to take advantage of snow days. You were out of school. And near my house, there was a park. Now, Lubbock, Texas is extremely flat. All right. Uh, it's so flat when your dog runs away from home, you can watch him run away from home for three weeks. All right. It's just that kind of thing. But we had a lake near our house and, and this lake had these crevices on the side, kind of like little canyons, you know, it wasn't really a canyon. It's only about three or four deep, but it was a canyon to us and it was a great place for snowball fights. So I'm out there with my brother Todd and our dear friends Lance and Rod Bowman and we've got a war going on. It was Rod and I against Lance and Todd and I mean it was an epic battle until Rod and I ran out of snowballs. Then it was a pummeling and we are just getting smashed and I looked at Rod and I looked over and saw a frozen lake I looked back to Rod and I said, we got to go. And so we took off running across a frozen lake. And I was like, this is working. And I was kind of excited. It's still frozen. This is good. But Lance and Todd came running after us. That was not so good. Because I, oh, now we're not going to be able to escape until this wonderful, wonderful sound happened. Right as we got to the other side of the lake and Lance and Todd are practically in the middle of it, you heard this eerie cracking sound. <laughs> and I turned around and looked just in time to see my brother and my best friend go under the ice. And all I could think was, this is it. It's over. I mean, nobody survives that, right? I mean, you've seen that all whole life. Somebody goes down in the ice. What do you do? What do you do? And there was a split second. There was a, what do you do? There was nothing. I mean, you always said, go grab a limb. And in West Texas, there's no trees. There's no limb to grab. And so I'm just sitting there, and I'm really freaking out. And I can see my brother and my best friend flailing with their arms up, screaming. And I'm like, I've got to get out there to say them. What do I do? What do I do? And then it hit me. The most brilliant idea hit me. Lots, Todd, stand up. I'm serious, stand up. And when they finally got their composure and stood up, the water was about here on them. <laughs> and when we saw that and they stood up, not only are they going to survive, but we've got a story to tell the rest of their life. And we were laughing so hard, all drenched. But have you ever been in an experience like that? Maybe not a frozen lake. But where you were so consumed thinking it's over, there's no hope, there's no way out of this. And then somebody goes, hey, stand up. Or hey, Maybe you're not seeing this clearly. Or, hey, maybe your fear has taken over you. Well, I believe that's a reality for all of us. 
And while we may not be those who have run across a frozen lake and been, quote, in a near-death experience, every single one of us have allowed ourselves to be consumed by this world, to see nothing but negativity, to see nothing but doom and gloom, and we fail to realize we have the most solid foundation that can ever be given, and that is the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, that's exactly what Paul says to us. You can stand in grace, and you can not only be assured of a foundation, but you can be concrete sure that this is a foundation that you can stand on no matter what you're going through. But this is hard for us to see at times because our eyes deceive us. Nobody's supposed to survive falling through the lake, right? It's over. It's over. That eerie sound, the cold temperatures, hypothermia, it's over. But if you can slow down for a moment and look with a different set of eyes, not the eyes of the person maybe engulfed in what seems to be a worldly turmoil, but to step back and to look at it through the eyes of our Lord, we'll see something different. We call that spiritual mindedness. To be spiritually minded is to take a step out of the carnal and to view things from a heavenly realm. And here's what you got to keep in mind. It looks a lot different from the Lord's point of view, from the heavenly host point of view, than it does from our point of view. Why is that? Because our eyes deceive us. What we see is often not reality. Let me qualify that for a moment. It is real. It's going to hurt you. You see it. But you're not seeing the whole picture. When, uh, when Eve was confronted by a talking snake, and can we all just agree, if a snake talks to you, that, that's a time to run. All right, can we be fair on that one? But apparently that happened, you know, back in the beginning. You remember what he did? He encouraged her to look at something. And what the text says is she perceived with her eyes that it was good to eat. How'd she know? Had she ever eaten it? Nobody sure looked good. It had that shiny appearance. Whatever that fruit was, boy, it looked good. Uh, the children of Israel, when they went in and spied out the land, remember? They thought, whoa, a land flowing milk and honey, that looks pretty good. Oh, but there's also giants. Ooh, they're going to defeat us. Oh, we don't have a chance. This looks bad, right? But they really didn't look with the right set of eyes. Uh, Samson, you got to love Samson. I mean, Samson was the first guy to be totally consumed by Instagram woman, right? I mean, Timna was on the screen, there was the woman of Timnah, and he's going, oh, whoa, look at her. Whoa, I got to have that. Mom, Dad, this right now, look at this. And we're all like, whoa, 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 time out, stud. You know what you're doing? You're not looking for the right things, and it cost him, right? Our eyes can deceive us. And there's been fake news in the world ever since Satan tempted Eve. So what's the opposite of spiritual mindedness? I want to be more spiritually minded. I want to have that focus. Well, what's the opposite? Well, it's worldly mindedness, right? And can I suggest to you that that is our greatest challenge in the Lord's church? there's a lot of things that we might consider to be issues or challenges we need to teach on this. And that's true, that's true, that's true. Especially there's even a lot of theology things. But worldliness and thinking with worldly minds is always going to be our greatest challenge. So how do we get over this? How do we get spiritually minded vision? How do we see the unseen? How do we get beyond the cracking ice and realize that we have something firm to stand on? Well, it begins, it begins with putting our hope in the Spirit himself. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in 1 Corinthians 2, the Apostle Paul is actually dealing with a church that has a lot of issues. Can that be fair to say? They're struggling with sexual immorality, even within their membership. They're dividing over who taught them the gospel, who is this, who is that. They're, 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 they're turning the Lord's Supper into a drunken feast. And their mind is not on heaven. Their mind is on mortal things. Their mind is on the world. And Paul is struggling to get them to change their minds. He's getting them... To encourage him to look with a different vision. And he said, even when you look at the cross, when a Greek looks at the cross, oh, it's foolishness. Oh, look at that. That's terrible. But a spiritually minded person looks at the cross and goes, oh, that's everything. That is my hope. How do I get from here to there? So here's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of God for their folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understand who understand who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well, I want to break this down for you because this this is deep stuff, all right? This is Paul encouraging all of us to not look at the world through human eyes, but to look at it through a different lens. And this is not easy for us because we really, really, if we're really honest, we put a lot of hope and a lot of confidence in what we see, right? That's part of reality. That's part of the way that we were made. God made us in this fashion. God gave us eyes. He gave us the ability of sight. But we, as spiritually minded people, want to be able to look at the world through the eyes of God, the Spirit of God, as Paul puts it here. And so what he speaks to us is he speaks to us in a way in which we can hopefully see and understand and grasp, well, how do I do this? Well, the first thing I need to see, first thing I need to grasp and understand is that spirituality, spirituality does not come through man's way of thinking, but it's the ability to focus upon spiritual truths, all right? And what you're able to do is you're able to see things through the wisdom of God's mind and not your own. To see it through his wisdom and not what may be conjured up in your own mind because of what you may physically see that's in front of you. And, and here's the deal that he says. These truths can only come from God. They come from his spirit. Uh, <laughs> Anybody know what I'm thinking right now? Anybody know? Anybody know? He said, oh, he's thinking about his next thought. No, I'm actually very hungry, and I'm thinking about where I want to go to lunch here in a little bit. You're thinking, really? Yeah, my son texted me just a moment ago and said, Dad, where are we meeting? And I'm like, I don't know. Now, how did you know that? You're like, dude, that's what he's really, th I did for a moment. How I told you, right? I told you. Well, the same way with spiritual-minded things. The only way you can know what the Spirit wants you to think and what the Spirit understands is to go to the Spirit himself and let him tell you. And God gives this knowledge to any and all of us freely. The world. The world has greatly hijacked the words 
spiritual. It really has. Some people think it's only for certain people that they have some deep knowledge or understanding. Some think it must come through your feelings. Oh, I, got, I feel more spiritual this time. No, no, no. Paul says, no, it's all given to God freely. And it's free to all of us if we'll simply take the time to listen to what the Spirit is telling us. In Ephesians 1, 17 to 18, Paul will plead to the church at Ephesus, it is my desire that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope and the inheritance that is there for all the saints. In other words, you can get this. It's not something that is just impossible to grasp. No, you can get this, and it comes from the mind of God. It's not going to come from the natural world, but it's going to come from the things that are spiritually. And in verse 13, he says, they are revealed by God's Spirit. We kind of shudder at that terminology sometimes if I if I was to start this I am filled with the spirit today y'all be going oh boy here we go he's gonna be taking that jacket off he may start rolling around whoa the spirit's go well that terminology scares us because we've seen the world misuse it but in reality every single one of us should be filled with the spirit we should be so consumed with the Spirit that it drives our intentions. It drives our thoughts. The Spirit of God drives my attitude and it drives my actions because I've allowed Him to come into me. And it's not something miraculous. It's not something where you have to go stand on some high mountain somewhere and go, oh, this is a beautiful vision, beautiful spot. It must come to me right here, Lord. No, 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 no. It, Paul says, no, no, no. It comes by listening to what God tells you straight from his own mind. Don't make it harder than it is. But those who are spiritually minded are those who are going to receive it because they recognize that there's a different set of eyes and they're not going to get it through natural means. And ultimately, the spiritually minded person, the spiritually minded person is able to look through a lens that is different from the natural man. So much so, notice verse 15. I love this, I love this, I love this. The spiritually minded person is so consumed with the lens that comes from God that when somebody of the world looks at them and judges them as being ignorant, as being out of touch, as being foolish, It just rolls right off them like water off a duck, and it doesn't bug them. Because the world is not their judge. I think if most of us are really honest with ourselves. We care way too much about what other people think about us. Is that fair? And, and here's kind of the... Here's the life lesson. We always put this on for the teens. Oh, peer pressure. Peer pressure doesn't end when you go off and, you know, start a family. We're all, we're all susceptible to peer pressure, right? But the spiritually minded person is so driven with learning the mind of God that even what the world may think about them doesn't bother them. Because they see something more. And so spiritual mindedness is just simply the things that pertain to the spirit of God. And don't run from that, brethren. D don't run from that terminology. I, I pray all the time that the spirit of the Lord will live in me, that my spirit will be his spirit, and that his spirit will be my spirit, and that I will be filled with his spirit because it simply represents the presence and the understanding and the wisdom of God. And when it fills our minds, it fills our hearts so that we react differently to the challenges of life. The mind of Christ. Notice verse 16. That's how he ends this. 
to have the mind of Christ. That'd be a great mind to have, wouldn't it? There, there was a movie that came out of, actually, maybe been a long time ago. It seems like a few years to be. Uh, the Beautiful Mind. Y'all remember that movie? Did I just show my age a little bit? But is there a more beautiful mind than to have the mind of Jesus? Who could say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Who does that? It's a heavy cup. It's a heavy cup. I, I wish it could pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Who does that? It's the mind of Christ. I actually committed myself a few years ago to try doing a little more understanding of the human mind, and it is really fascinating. And, and one of the places that my study and my research uh, led me was to the Navy SEALs training program. You know, anybody here ever wanted to be a Navy SEAL? Oh, that'd be so cool, wouldn't it? I wouldn't last a day, but I think I could, you know. And, and, and when you go and you study about their training regiment, you, you, you see all the physical turmoil that they're, they're put through. You, you, you see the cold water. You see carrying the heavy logs. You see the sweat. You see the pain. You, and you think, oh, oh, this is a physical endurance test. This is about having to make your body go farther than you ever thought it could and to build up those muscles and to build up that body so that it can endure anything. And and when you go and you really look at their training, it isn't so much about that at all. It's about training the mind. And what, what the training does is it challenges these warriors to use fear, pain, and exhaustion to their benefit. Because when that panic, that panic turmoil fills your heart and that adrenaline starts filling you and you want to have this fight or flight mentality, they are taught to use their mind at that moment to recognize that their body is now primed to see what it has never seen before, to slow down and to think there is a possible way of escape. What well, has my training taught me in this? How do I get out of this situation? And so they're taught to use fear to become even more powerful in their service. It's really amazing when you think about it. But then the more I got into that study and I was so enamored with the Navy SEALs and who they are and what they do, and boy, do I have great respect for those that are Navy SEALs. I couldn't help but think that that's exactly what our Lord Jesus is trying to instill in us to have a mind like no one else. To truly have the mind of the Spirit of God. And so I want to leave you, I want to leave you just real quick with four take-homes, four practical suggestions so that we can really make this a reality, so that we can see the unseen, so that we can have hope in what is really there and not to be fooled by the world. And so we're going to look at it through the acronym of the mind, all right? So let's begin with M. What's the very first thing you need to do if you're going to build a spiritual mind? What's the very first thing we're going to need to do if we want to have the mind of our Lord and really think spiritually and not physically as the world? Well, we need to meditate on spiritual things. Do you remember what? Remember what, remember what the Lord told um, Joshua after his great mentor and friend Moses had died, and now he's in charge of millions of whining and complaining people? What a great job. Would you ever apply for that job? I want to lead millions who whine and complain all the time. Yes. They're not going to be happy about food or water or anything. Yes. Here, send me. Oh, yeah. Be in a desert? Absolutely. Woo. So you can understand Joshua's trepidation even though he's an older man. Remember what the Lord said to him? Be strong and courageous. 
For I will cause these people to inherit the land that I promised to their fathers before them. Only you be strong and courageous and meditate on my word day and night. Hey, that's kind of a lost art. Anybody here have to say memory verses as a kid? Anybody here really love it? I used to try to make my kids act them out. All right, be strong and crazy. Whatever I had to do, you know. It's like, oh, it was like pulling teeth. Oh, yeah. you know what happened though? They learned them because you had to meditate on it. And meditation implies slowing down and not just reading a passage, but as the psalmist says in Psalms 119 verse 15, to fix our eyes on the Lord, to meditate on his precepts. And, and what you find over and over and over again, even in that wonderful passage about the word of the Lord in Psalms 119, is that constantly, constantly, over and over, the word meditation is used. Have a little fun with you real quick for a moment, all right? Play along, play along, okay? I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. You're peeking, you're peeking. Close, nobody's going to goose you, I promise. All right, keep your eyes closed. Do you know what you're seeing right now? I know some of you think, my eyelids, duh. No, no. You know what you're seeing right now? Is everything that you literally own. Keep them closed. We're still going. You're seeing everything that's going to last forever. You're looking at everything that truly has value. Open your eyes. Get the point? But the only way you're going to be able to see beyond this world is you need to close your eyes and go, okay, what's real? Heaven and earth will pass away, but what's going to last forever? I don't know your Bibles. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but why? My what? My word. My word will live forever. That's why you meditate on the Word. Can, can I give a little advice to many of us here? It's time to quit watching the news channels. You, you, you'll survive. You're sur I, I'm a former newsman. That used to be my life. Because there's something more important to listen to. Meditate. Meditate on the law of God. Meditate on the will of God. In, in Hebrews chapter 11 and in verses 13 to 16, you know what every single person in that great hall of faith had in common? Every single one of them had this in common. And here's what the Hebrew writer says. They were able to see a country. They were able to see a city whose builder and maker was God. And if they had any opportunity to return to where they formerly had been, they could have done it. But they didn't go back there. They went to see the unseen seen because they could close their eyes and know it was there and they believed it spiritual mindedness begins first and foremost with meditating on the spirit of God himself his word and his blessings but then you take it a step further you're going to initiate this knowledge you're going to initiate this understanding and you're going to put it into spiritual action you're going to go uh, turn in your Bibles over to Colossians 3 Colossians 3 something tells me that this was a sermon series that Paul took on the road because you not only find this when he preaches to the church of Colossae you also find it when he speaks to the church at Ephesus and here's what he says when he shares it with the church of Colossae chapter 3 verse 1 if you have been raised with Christ have you been raised with Christ have you have you been raised with Christ well if you've been raised with Christ you seek those things that are above you seek the place where Christ is you seek the things where Christ is at the right hand of God verse 2 and you set your mind on things that are above 
not on things of the earth. Why? Because your physical life is gone. Your physical desires are gone. Your worldly mindset is gone. You've hidden it. That man has died, and a new man has taken his place, and this is the one who lives for Christ. Turn the page or just skip a few verses. And so here's what you're going to do in verse 5. You're going to get rid of anything that is carnal. You're going to get rid of anything that is worldly. You're going to recognize when you're floundering in the ice of despair, when you're floundering in the folly of this world, and you're going to cast it aside. Sexual immorality, i got to get rid of it. And that may mean, can I just share something to you, all you guys, especially I made this little clip earlier and we laughed about it, but Instagram and the visual social media is kicking your butt. And sometimes the only way to deal with things is just to get rid of it. All sexual immorality began first with the eyeballs. I cast it aside. And and it's not just sexual immorality, but covetousness, evil desires, the passions of the world, uh, the the practice of selfishness. And and therefore, that's no longer. And so verse 12, verse 12, verse 12, it's not just about what you don't do. It's what you are doing. You are now a chosen vessel. So what you're going to strive, and here's how you're going to put it into action. You're going to become a person of compassion. You're going to become a person of kindness. You're going to seek to be a person of humility and meekness and patience. You're going to be a person that's forgiving. You're going to be a person who's bearing with others. That's how you put it in action. The last time somebody really irritated you, how'd you respond? Well, the natural man, real easy, seeks to irritate them back. (laughs) Hi, I'm Phil. I'm not very patient. You honk at me, I'll honk at you. Your car's not moving quickly enough, I'll let you know it. I talk to people all the time, forgive me, I'm Phil, a little impatient. It's an easy trap to fall into in so many ways. But patience, self-control, joy, peace, They're all the fruit of the Spirit. (laughs) And here's how you know you're making the transition. When you have to force yourself to do it. (laughs) Anybody here ever prayed for patience? Oh, man, I used to pray for patience all the time. It's like I had more and more and more frustrating encounters in my life and challenges to deal with. And then it hit me. Oh, I'm doing this all wrong. Lord, I got plenty of patience. Because I think that when I pray for it, oh, that means poof, it all disappears. No, when you pray for it, poof, here's more enabling ways for you to deal with it and to become patient. We often... Reduce spirituality to a feeling. Ooh, I just feel more spiritual. Don't get lost in that. Sometimes the most spiritually minded person is the person who on the inside is ready to explode, ready to respond in the manner in which the natural man does, but they fight it off and they go, I bless you. I love you. Don't read my mind. Just listen to my words. Because being spiritually minded isn't easy. And please don't ever think that it's always easy for God to love us. There was nothing easy or comfortable about it. But he did it. Because he has a different mind. There's nothing easy about loving your enemy, but you do it. Because it's a different set of eyes. And so... 
You put it in action. And then what do you do? You negate the fears of this world. Why? Here's how Paul says it in 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God did not give us a spirit of fear. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. No, he gave us a spirit of power. He gave us a spirit of love. He gave us a spirit, as it says in the English Standard Version, of self-control. Some of your Bibles put it like this. He gave us a spirit of a sound mind. In other words, this is healthy thinking. This is the sound thinking. The individual who's not consumed by the fears and the lusts and the desires of this world and always trying to please this world and always falling into the traps and the desires of this world. But this is the person who can get beyond that fear and recognize that God's given them a spirit that is much more powerful than that. And it is a spirit of love. It is a spirit of sound thinking. Uh, Anybody here a mean parent, just out of curiosity? I am. I'll say it right now. If my kids were here, they'd say, yes. The meanest thing, one of the meanest things I ever did to my kids is I made them ride roller coasters. As soon as you got tall enough, we're going on. Oh, no, daddy, no, daddy, no, daddy, no. No, you're going to love it. I'm telling you, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. I, mean, I talked Jill into riding Space Mountain. Y'all ridden Space Mountain? Oh, yeah, that was so much fun. I forgot how dark it was in there. Man, you're gyrating. And so I talked her in. You're, trust me, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. I promise you're not going to die. Daddy's going to be with you the whole way. You're not going to die. And so I talked her in. We got on it, and we started riding it. And I was like, ooh, this is a little worse than I imagined. And I'm kind of worried. Like, oh, man, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. When we got to the bottom where you're going through the tunnel, it's all flashing. Jill looks back, and she goes, hey, Dad. I said, what? She goes, I didn't die. Yeah, we got off. I said, you want to ride it again? She went, nope, but I didn't die. You know what we need to do, folks? We need to live with that kind of confidence. In fact, that confidence can become so powerful that even death itself is not our fear. Clydeen Lovelady was a lady in our congregation. Actually, Mary Mosley's mom was up with us in Gainesville. and It was close to the end of her life, and it looked like it was pretty close to the end, and she was gathered with her family, and, and her son led a prayer, and he said, Lord, Lord, please, please help my mom. Give her strength and help her to live longer and help her to get healthy, and help her to be back where she once was. And as soon as he got done with that beautiful prayer, she looked at him and she said, don't ever pray that prayer again. I'm ready to go. Pray that he'll take me home. Because when I close my eyes, I see all that I need to see. A spiritually minded person can negate the fears of this world. And then here's what we're going to do finally. We're not just going to meditate. We're not just going to initiate. We're not just going to negate. We're going to do as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, our scripture reading. We're going to detonate. And we're going to blow up the fleshly mindset for though we walk in the flesh we're not waging war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh but they have divine power to destroy strongholds we destroy arguments we destroy every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take it captive in obedience to Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Tertullian is one of the great first fathers that you read about in church history. You don't see him in the Bible, but you see him in a lot of the ancient writings. He lived in the time that Christians were being greatly persecuted for their faith. He wasn't just somebody on a television screen denouncing 
Christianity. No, 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 no. It was literal persecution. And this great man of God said this. The legs do not feel the chains when the mind is on heaven. Isn't that a great line? That's blowing up the strongholds of worldly thinking. And the reminder is we're not waging war against the flesh. Flesh is not your appetite. You crave more and more of the Spirit. My dear friend and writer, Jim McGuigan, who's actually going to be here tomorrow in the area. Look forward to seeing him. He talks a lot about his wife, Ethel, the love of his life for many, many years, who at the end of her life was enduring like so many do with a failing body and as a loving husband he's taking care of her he said this quote the raging fever is real the grasping for air is real The incubators, the straps, the tubes, the needles, the pumps, the drips, they're all real. The silent screaming, the wide open mouths, the toothless gums, the jerking, the twisting, the silent panning, it's all real. There's no point denying it. There is reality in all that. But what if what we see is not all there is? What if there's more? What if there's more than just what we see? Wouldn't you want to be able to believe that there's more to life than this? One day, outside Jerusalem, there was a young man hanging on public gallows. He was covered in spit, sweat, Blood, jeers, taunts, treachery, hypocrisy, hatred. It was all real. His thirst, his loneliness, his sense of abandonment, his grief and the grief of his mother and friends, the injustice, the evil. It was all real. But there was more. No, in all that, there was more. And not just what was to come. There was more even in that moment. There was more to be seen. For our loving Heavenly Father would say and speak through His Son. And His Son would be filled with His own Spirit. So much so that in that moment, in that great distress, in that great panic and that fear, He could say, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name even now in this hour. Then a voice came down from heaven and said, I've glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there heard it, and some said it was thunder. Some said an angel spoke. And Jesus said, no, this voice. This voice came from one you cannot see, but you can hear. And it's for your sake. For now. Even when nails and blood and thorns and tears and pain, now the judgment of this world has come. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out and I will be lifted up from the earth and I'll draw all people to myself. There's more. 
There's more. There's more than what you see. See it. Believe it. Stand in it. For even when the ice is crackling all around you and you feel like you're flailing about, stop. Meditate, initiate, negate, and detonate that worldly stronghold. And you stand firmly in the grace of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be spiritually minded. And it's real. It's real. And it's certain. And what a blessed thought it is to know there is so much more than what we see. There might be somebody here this morning who's never really given this a lot of thought till now. Boy, I'm happy if that's the case. Because I want you to take your mind back to Calvary and I want you to meditate on that cross and think about why did that happen it happened for you it happened for me so that our Lord could take us away from this world and take us where we belong what we were intended to be and where we were intended to be from the very beginning and that is with our loving Heavenly Father and walking side by side with Him and enjoying all the blessings that He has ready to bestow upon And you can receive that assurance this morning if you'll just come and allow allow him to wash you in the blood of Jesus Christ. To have all your sins washed away so that you are cleansed. And you now look at this world with a different set of eyes. The eyes of the Spirit of God. For that, is the 2020 vision we all need to see heaven. In Revelation chapter 22, that's where it all ends, right? And they shall see the face of God. It's real. Do you want to see that this morning? Do you want to find what is real and have true hope? We invite you to come to your Lord Jesus even now as we stand and as we sing.